Я рада пригласить Анну Нашер, нашего гостя из Института аудиовизуальных искусств Егелонского университета, города Краков. И доклад, который Анна прочитает нам, будет называться «Память места или память сообществ. Локальный медиа-арт. Информационный поток и движение в пространстве». Actually, my presentation concerns a very basic thing, and I guess I probably uh, change the topics a little bit. A little bit. Uh, I'm a media studies scholar, uh, interested mostly in media art, so that's going to be uh, something different from what we have discussed so far. And I must say that uh, I find those uh, discussions really interesting, and there were some concepts I, I really can relate to and, uh, um, uh, and also probably build on uh, in, in my talk. Um, well, my talk, my talk will concern uh the the issue of locative media art and uh, the title uh, i gave it is the memory of place or the memory of networks because for the several last years i'm uh, i mostly i've been working on the issue of uh, how uh, digital studies how the uh, um, concepts uh, worked out within digital studies field actually change the very um the very stable notions, uh, cultural notions like subjects, subject, space, place, representation. So what I want to present today is uh, basically mm, uh, some questions on how memory of place is being transformed uh, in the conditions of widespread uh, network communication. And uh, First, I would like to start with a short definition. I'm not sure how many of you is familiar with uh, the locative media art. Uh, <laughs> all of us, all of us, we, we use um, uh, locative media or geo media almost every day. Um, only didn't realize that actually it is um, a specific concept. So, locative media art has developed as a uh, artistic practices that um, use the location aware devices and of course I won't be reading my definitions here you can read it for yourself I, I only want to say that uh, at the moment um, uh, when th this um, practice um, the way the, the practice has uh, evolved um, has something to do with the fact how those geo media and locative media look like today. I mean, back in 2003, when the concept of locative media has been coined during the Art Plus Com Festival in Lepaya, Latvia. So back then, uh, I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> if you're aware, in 2003, none of us actually could have one single device that would incorporate any locative technologies. So what artists did uh, then was experimenting with GPS technology, with uh, mobile uh, communication, and with uh, some other uh, devices that back then uh, sort of um, uh, were uh, sort of were treated as uh, ubiquitous computing. I mean, PDA or personal digital assistance, and etc. So, what I want to say is that today we have just one device. The most often it is our smartphone or uh, tablet or anything like this. Back then, there were several different devices that artists had to. Um, uh, experiment with to get the uh, results. And uh, during this festival, um, um, some important locative media arts projects uh, have been initiated, mostly a uh, milk project by Eva uh, Yuzina and Esther Polak, which is probably one of the best known projects in this area uh, and one of the most uh, quoted and, and cited. And also the projects like Here, Here by Pete Gomez, um, also Geo Cinema, uh, most of them use GPS and geo tagging as a way to uh, um, um, introduce a specific meanings about the place and about the memory of the place because uh, Liepaja is a very special uh, area. There is a Karosta, the uh, 
former the place where um, nuclear power uh, plant was located once. So um, uh, those projects really uh, touched on the issue of uh, of a cited um, uh, of the memory of the of the uh, memory of the place actually. Of course, similar project has been uh, have been carried out uh, even before. So we have the whole um, range of earlier art projects using GPS, although uh, back then um, uh, the notion of locative media art has not been yet proposed. And uh, those early projects are really interesting, especially from today's point of view. I mean, Laura Corgan would be one of the pioneers, Masaki Fujihata, Andrea Olensak, Marco Pelehan, who uh, uh, has been using um, Geomedia and locative technologies uh, for a very long time now. And especially important to me today is a project by Terry Rueb called Drift. Will you be showing any of those? Um, I will show uh, samples of okay. this in a moment. Uh, it's because actually I'm just introducing the field mm -hmm. uh, in, a, the, in the shortest way possible because otherwise I would discuss it for another half an hour <laughs> so <laughs> so i just i just prepared it as a kind of a, um overview for those who are interested in the subject you can you can check those projects for yourself and uh, uh, in fact these projects are really really interesting from from uh, the point of view we're discussing today i mean me memory studies especially that would be interesting from uh, from um the point of view um that has been expressed by Professor Vasiliev. I mean, this interface of memory studies and media studies is particularly important. So uh, I will show you uh, some of the most interesting projects in this field, most well known, I guess. One of one of those is um, uh, 34 North uh, 118 West. Uh, carried out in Los Angeles and uh, designed by Jeremy Hyde, Naomi Spellman, and Jeff Knowlton. And uh, um, well, Jeremy Hyde has coined the uh, concept of narrative archaeology uh, on this occasion. It is basically a project that has been carried out in a very special place on the crossroad of two streets in Los Angeles. And some some sound clips with sh with short um, um, uh, with short text, fragments of text, uh, have been placed in the physical space and those uh, files have been, uh, uh, could, uh, could have been uh, um, played by the people who took part in the project. In other ways, you would be walking around the city and uh, uh, your walk would trigger uh, specific texts in a, uh, particular places. It was a long time ago. Right now, we have some, uh, some, uh, I guess, consumer applications that do exactly the same thing, like the popular guidebook, guidebooks, etc. Uh, this project touched on the issue of the particular history of this place, where some Chinese workers uh, worked in 19th century, and it brought about uh, some contested uh, meanings. I mean, the, 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 this was the memory as a place of negotiation uh, and um, oppositional thinking as well. Another well-known project is uh, Amsterdam Real Time, um, carried out by WAG Society from Amsterdam, and also designed by Esther Poag and John Key. And it required a special uh, software Back then, people had to re, um, write a special software to enable people walking with the, their mobile uh, devices uh, um, um, contained the GPS uh, receivers. So uh, those devices enabled participants to transmit uh, the data on their movement about the about the space. So this map was actually uh, drawn in the real time. Uh, um, along with the people who moved around the city, these uh, lines get brighter or darker. So it was like a map, uh, only drawn in a real time, a map of a real subjects uh, uh, drifting around the city with their uh, locational devices. Today, I guess, uh, uh, designing such an application uh, would probably be much easier task 
considering the fact that uh, we have the, the, uh, the, the smartphones and, and other devices which are uh, already GPS, GPS enabled. Another uh, famous project consists of several um, um, installations, several um, uh, installments called biomapping. Here we can see a motion map. Um, back in 2004, uh, Christian Nold has built um, the device that uh, that he called um, 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 anyway. It was a device that uh, registered um, uh, the temperature of the skin and uh, it also registers if we're sweating or not uh, and uh, pulse the, the heartbeat so uh, all those data were transmitted uh, and uh, uh, it also generated automatically generated the visual um, and uh, at least six people took part in this project back then so what you could see in this uh, image uh, in the upper part is um, th th this, this big uh, peak uh, violet peak is the place where most people got um, uh, got actually very strong emotional response um, it was probably triggered by the heavy uh, car traffic uh, in this particular location. So uh, this automatic visualizations uh, sort of represented emotional and affective response of the participants. But the most important thing is uh, the participants later uh, uh, were able to describe the kind of emotion that uh, was triggered and um, they provided their own narratives, narratives and explanations about, um, about the events. And you can see, see it uh, in the image below, where those uh, uh, colorful points, um, of course, red would be the most intense uh, emotional, emotionally, uh, uh, the place that, that triggered the most effective uh, reactions, and the blue would be the one that is the most quiet, sort of. Uh, in this regard. So you can see uh, the textual, the verbal information about what factors um, 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 caused uh, which emotion. Uh, and today um, it is also, uh, uh, it, it resembles some uh, uh, widespread uh, application, applications available uh, for average user, I think, especially uh, um, the fitness applications and wellness. Um, there's the whole movement called quantified self, where we have all kinds of gadgets and devices that we put on our wrists, for example, why um, tra training, <laughs> so it uh, transfer um, all the data that our uh, bodies uh, emit. Uh, another one, it is uh, this is probably the, the, the uh, best known, um, the whole uh, selection of uh, hybrid reality games designed by Blast Theory. By now this is classics, I mean, in the field of locative media art. These are the projects that, that they probably uh, um, discussed the, the most often. Basically, all of them uh, involved uh, the situation of... Uh, uh, mixing the re digital reality that happens in our, on, our, on, the, on, the, on the computer screen and the physical uh, reality of the city. So, for example, uh, in this game, Uncle Roy All Around You, uh, what you had was a pair of participants. One of them was sitting in front of a computer, another one was uh, walking around the city. And uh, the person who uh, had a computer at uh, his or her disposal um, sort of navigated the person in the city to help her or him find the right place. And uh, um, there was a certain narrative structure behind it as well. And as I said, you can uh, check uh, those projects uh, yourself. Actually, Blast Theory has a very informative website with plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, uh, visual and audiovisual materials, and it's worth it to see. And the last of the well-known project is uh, probably the most 
uh, one of the most controversial ones, Transborder Immigra Immigrant Tool, uh, designed by Ricardo Dominguez, um, uh, who had also been involved with electronic disturbance, disturbance theater, and uh, it consisted of a very simple application designed for the people who illegally cross uh, the American-Mexican border. As you probably know, this is one of the places in the world where, where the uh, issues uh, uh, of illegal migration are probably the most uh, divisive. Um, and uh, it is also one of the most uh, uh, dangerous places when uh, many people from Mexico trying to illegally uh, penetrate the American Mexican American border actually dies from both uh, food deprivation from hunger or from uh, from dehydration from uh, tough natural conditions uh, so uh, what artists did was they uh, designed a special application that would um, uh, tell the people where for example, they can find some food supplies or water supplies uh, the application would also uh, uh, warned them about the police patrols and uh, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, dangers in the in the area. So, uh, as you can probably uh, see, this is a really controversial thing, and uh, I can't even imagine a similar project right now in Europe in these conditions we are uh, under at the moment. Um, this is just a short introduction to give you an overview of what locative media art actually is. But my question actually, um, but the main subject of my talk is certain transformation that has happened um, in, in this field uh, between 2003 or say the end of the 90s uh, up until uh, now. And this transformation, well, I, I gave it the title with uh, which um, actually uh, um, is allusion to uh, two projects I'm going to talk about. This transformation is from drift to border bumping. In other words, uh, uh, I think, this is my, my uh, 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 hypothesis, that we can see certain processes going on within the field of locative media art where uh, when at first artists were interested in using GPS as a new uh, technology, the one that allows to tell the stories in a different way. Um, and they didn't pay actually much attention to a GPS as, as a technology itself, except for the earliest projects, because Laura Corgan was the person that was really interested in GPS technology as such. Of course, this is the technology that uh, comes from uh, military research, and as you probably know, in 2000, uh, the, the art projects actually have been uh, uh, made possible, because up until 2000, the GPS was inaccurate. Whenever uh, people wanted to use this technology in a civil uh, um, based project. Uh, I mean, civilians couldn't really use GPS because uh, it wouldn't be accurate enough. Actually, it, the, the, the measures could vary as much as uh, 10 kilometers. <laughs> so, um, uh, any, um, any uh, uh, art project that would seriously um, engage this technology um, have been possible as late as 2000. So, uh, let me start with one of the projects I mentioned before, that will be uh, Drift by Terry Rueb. And as you probably uh, can see, um, it also um, uh, brings some situationist concepts to mind. Of course, this is the concept of derive, coined by Ivan Chechkloff, <laughs> um, um, a very a uh, particular, very special uh, um, person. Uh, derive or drifting is meant as a uh, technique of getting lost uh, in the city, getting lost on a purpose. Like putting yourself in the situation where you don't know where you are, when the movement around the city actually is a kind of a research as well, I would say. It's like, it's 
connected to uh, the whole idea of psychogeography and also uh, it is connected to the idea of uh, free movement as a um, kind of oppositional strategy directed at the capitalist uh, divisions uh, uh, within society. So let me show you a very short clip and I hope we will have the sound as well. Uh, that will mm, uh, explain the project itself. Drift is a responsive sound environment installed along the coastline of the Wadden Sea in northern Germany. Visitors to the installation are invited to wander the tidal flats that stretch nearly five kilometers off the coastline at the low tide. While wandering, visitors discover areas of interactive sound that play in response to their movement through the landscape. The areas of sound drift with the tides so there is no way of knowing exactly where the sounds will occur at any given moment. Absolute position and relative movement are explored as mobile visitors discover that they may also experience this interactive work by simply standing still. The Wadden Sea becomes a metaphor for Hertzian space as visitors are asked to lose themselves in a space of layered currents of sand, sea, and interactive sounds that drift with the tides and the subtle movement of satellites. The installation consists of a two kilometer square region of sound areas that drifts with the tide. At low tide, the sounds linger on the tidal flats. At high tide, they flood the landmass of the little town of Cuxhaven. Sounds are nested in pairs of concentric areas. The sound of footsteps fills the larger region of each pair. Spoken word is layered with the sound of footsteps as visitors enter the inner region. Spoken word passages include excerpts from various literary traditions dealing with themes of wandering, being lost, and drifting. They are presented in different languages, referencing the drift in meaning, inherent in translation. Technical components of the design include a small pocket PC equipped with a GPS card and headphones. Custom software written in Java determines the drift of the sound areas and manages sound playback as visitors pass through them. So as you could, as you can see, um, uh, the project has been carried carried out in an um, interesting place, which is sort of in between area uh, two. I mean, the place where usually. Or, or the, where we can experience the low and high tide. Uh, in other words, this is the place where, uh, which is not really stable land, and at the same time, it is not a sea uh, uh, water either. I'm sure close to St. Petersburg, there has to be similar places as well, since it is close to a Baltic uh, seaside. Um, but what is important to me here is also the kind of the equipment that uh, Terry uh, Rue um, um, used back in 2004. As you could see, there is no single device. There is a couple of them uh, connected. And there is this um, software that um, uh, enables people to listen to a short um, text uh, trigger automatically uh, when they move around the, the place. So the people equipped with headphones can actually hear uh, particular uh, poems and the fragments of novel uh, in a special places. And as we uh, could hear, uh, all those fragments have something to do with the movement about this, the space, about being um, lost. And my question actually is if we really can get lost these days? That, that would be an uh, important question. And as a comparison, I will uh, 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 briefly mention another project uh, designed by uh, Julian Oliver, 
um, almost 10 years later in 2012. And this is uh, actually what you can um, see here. You, you can also find uh, the website for this project on the web, uh, but uh, now there is just a demo version available since the project is d d discontinued. Anyway, what Julian Oliver did was he uh, researched the way that mobile uh, networks, uh, mobile communication networks uh, operate. I don't know if you probably noticed that whenever we uh, travel between two countries, uh, we usually take uh, the networks with us. For example, I very often uh, move between Poland and Slovakia because uh, we have a mountain uh, hat uh, in the Slovakian mountains, so I spend there as many weekends as I can. And whenever I go to uh, my, my mountain lodge, um, although it is located in Slovakian mountains, usually I have the Polish mobile um, network operator uh, on my phone. So what Julian Oliver did, he actually registered all the, uh, all the moments when people moving uh, across the border uh, take those networks with them um, uh, uh, so it looks like the actual state border gets uh, modified. So like moving across borders changes uh, 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 the state borders. So it is like here, for example, you can see uh, three examples. One is uh, on the Slovenian-Austrian border. Another one is Polish-German border. And yet another is... Uh, I guess, uh, French-Spanish um, border. And um, uh, you can see the lines uh, which represent the actual state border and the border that uh, uh, is moving with the people um, um, uh, crossing um, th th those borders. So um, this is another... Uh, uh, example of memory of the place, only this time, actually, it, is, uh, it involves the technical agen agents. I, I would call them the technical agents, the non-human agencies, uh, which are um, software, the algorithm that uh, governs the way we communicate with mobile operator, and uh, uh, another uh, also um, there's quite a few factors that are not really to explain. For example, if you connect to the Wi-Fi, uh, I'm sure every one of you usually uh, uh, expects some sort of troubles, either because the signal is too weak uh, or because the walls are too thick uh, or sometimes because of the weather conditions. In other words, if you look closer uh, into technicalities of this process, and I don't want to bore you with all those details, but if you looked uh, closer, you would uh, um, see something like there are two algorithms. One is called Fourier algorithm, another is called Viterbi's algorithm, and these are highly unstable uh, um, um, math mathematical procedures that govern the way we uh, receive the signal uh, receive the information over Wi-Fi networks and uh, the way we send the information uh, in the Wi-Fi networks. And uh, to me, this is the clue uh, of my today's subject because this Wi-Fi connection or cellular uh, connection is something that we usually overview. Uh, we usually uh, forget about it whenever we talk about uh, uh, digital culture. It is like in between us and the digital image, there is always some kind of the uh, uh, connection. And these days, this is mostly uh, uh, wireless connection. So it changes a lot because uh, the whole um, uh, IT uh, infrastructure is taken into the air. Uh, uh, so, but uh, another important thing is uh, actually the question, has the memory of place changed? Uh, considering the fact that today uh, we 
usually move around the city with the devices that are, that are already connected to the internet. And uh, this is not the computer like, like it used to be back in the 90s. Uh, it is not a one computer connected with wires. It is uh, uh, actually uh, a lot of objects, a lot of things that are uh, um, connected, that are um, able to communicate. And I don't mean only GPS-enabled devices like our smartphones. I also mean all uh, sensor networks, uh, all uh, the objects that have uh, uh, RFID tags. Uh, in other words, more and more of, the, uh, of our practices um, involves this kind of uh, non-human non-human uh, agencies. And to me, those two projects, uh, Terry Rueb on the one hand and, uh, and uh, Julian Oliver's border bumping on another, uh, actually this comparison embodies the change I want to um, uh, uh, say a few words about now. And uh, the difference is that today we uh, increasingly walk in uh, space that can be uh, called code space. And this is the concept I took from a book by uh, Rob Kitchen and Martin Dodge, Code Space, Software and Everyday Life. The book has been published in 2011. And uh, those two researchers who for ages have been active in the field of human geography and they researched uh, mostly the connections between media and uh, physical space. So they coined two uh, uh, useful concepts in this book. Uh, they say that uh, uh, we encounter uh, two kinds of spaces nowadays. One of them is coded space and another Another one is code space. And the difference uh, seems quite uh, easy to grasp. Coded spaces uh, um, um, are, are, are the phenomena that uh, make uh, um, speciali speciality or space and a code almost indistinguish, uh, pr sorry, that, that make uh, sp space and code uh, um, close together, but not too close together. I mean, for example, you're sitting here in this very room and most of you have internet connection and you can already uh, check the things I was talking about before. So you can look for the artist's projects, for what they um, uh, did before. You can check uh, this book I presented before. So uh, this is the kind of a space where uh, software and um, uh, communication and the physical space are closely related. But if we didn't have uh, internet connection here, we still would be able to talk, to discuss, to exchange ideas. So these two spheres, digital and physical, um, are not are not functionally dependent on one each other. Uh, completely different uh, uh, meaning has this uh, second concept, code space. This is the place where uh, actually what's digital and what's physical gets so close together, it, it, it is combined very closely, that without uh, internet connection, the place is not able to function at all. For example, the airport. This is the classical, the, the, the classic example. Wherever you go to the airport, and there is no internet connection because of some kind of a break. Um, um, the airport is not able to, you know, um, uh, to operate, right? So that would be a, a typical for code space. And uh, what is important to me is that whenever we walk uh, in this code space um, area, uh, we become searchable um, and you probably already have heard about it that uh, um, that's being a subject subjects human subjects with our devices in hand uh, we uh, constantly uh, transmit 
a lot of data about what we do, um, about when and where we move, about uh, what we read, what we buy. So this kind of a space where physical um, and digital gets really close um, um, produces something that both researchers called ambient findability. In other words, uh, places are um, open to uh, any kind of search and uh, data processing is a very basic activity in, in, in this uh, um, environment. Um, and it also, uh, uh, it also uh, uh, produces another um, outcomes uh, that as a human uh, subjects today, um, we are accompanied with data shadows and data trails. Data shadow is uh, our sort of uh, portrait, representation of our behavior on the internet and data trail is uh, the representation of our movement around the space. And this very thing, uh, this very uh, uh, feature of code space is something that, uh, uh, to me, uh, changes this, the whole concept of cultural memory and memory of a place. Uh, because these days, uh, we probably have to uh, deconstruct this uh, famous, well-known ideas, so that it can incorporate all those non-human agencies that we confront in our everyday lives constantly. For example, today Professor Vasiliev uh, couldn't hear us, we couldn't see him, and it's not just a coincidence, uh, it, it is not just a mistake in communication, <laughs> I think... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it also is, but on the other hand, whenever you confront these mistakes, um, uh, uh, it is actually the moment when we became aware that there is this kind of a mediation between us and the content we, we want to uh, uh, have, we want to get. So that's why I think that uh, um, those moments should be interpreted not only as communication breaks or, or mistakes or technical uh, obsolescences. Uh, these moments actually are, uh, are the... Mm, uh, 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 are the moments where we can see and experience how those non-human technical agents come to the fore, how they come uh, become visible. Um, so uh, this difference between Terry Rueb drift and uh, uh, Julian Oliver uh, border bumping uh, embodies this very uh, change in interpretations, while to Terry Rueb, uh, the GPS technology and uh, uh, locative media and uh, mobile communication was uh, somehow transparent, she just used it as a tool, as a vehicle. Uh, to Julian Oliver, the very same things actually are problematic. They are reflexive. Uh, uh, the artist wants us to know, uh, to be aware, of this whole uh, intermediary thing between us and the content. And uh, he also makes the operation of networks visible in this way. So uh, th th this, this difference uh, um, uh, is uh, um, can serve as the inspiration to rethink the concept of cultural memory. So that's all what I wanted to say today. Thank you very much for your attention and спасибо большое Наталья за приглашение меня здесь. Я думаю, что сейчас еще время сказать большое спасибо польскому институту за то, что это приглашение оказалось Большое спасибо польскому институту тоже. Thank you very much. Okay, Есть you. кому его услышать теперь, это спасибо. Um, что ж, um, um, теперь я буду говорить спасибо. Большое спасибо, Анна, за замечательный доклад. Um, итак, я предлагаю задавать вопросы на русском или на английском, может быть, на польском. Um, непонятно, правда, как их переводить тогда. Um, так, если ни у кого нет вопросов то сейчас 
Я буду их задавать, если никто не хочет. Нет? Нет желающих? Ну ладно. Нет, ну я... это смотря кто пришел. Я дико извиняюсь, меня задержали государственные дела. Я хотела спросить, есть ли польские теоретики, на которых вы тоже посылаетесь, или польские художники? Если они были упомянуты в этой лекции, ну я спрошу вас позже, а если нет, интересно было бы услышать, как выглядит эта теоретическая сфера в Польше. Спасибо. I understood it. Yes, I know. Um, I understood. It. As I said, I, I understand, understand quite a lot. So, um, so uh, I'm sorry to say that, but during this talk, this particular talk, I didn't actually mention any of the Polish scholar or researcher, but I should have, since, um, uh, well, in my book that is going to appear next week, I uh, also um, Uh, touch on the issue of post-media condition that has already been, been mentioned here. And uh, Ryszard Kluszczyński, one of those typical Polish names, very long structure with a lot of shit -sh thing. Uh, Ryszard Kluszczyński, who is probably the best known uh, digital media and media arts scholar in Poland, uh, coined actually the phrase of, uh, mm, uh, of uh, media artwork as a network networked media artwork and um, I uh, uh, in my book I uh, uh, address this concept at least several times because all the uh, artworks I have presented here actually this was a kind of a mystification from my side because these are the type of, a, the, of the artwork that you cannot really represent there is no single uh, media um, base, there's no single, as we say in a film and media theory, there's no single apparatus, no single dispositive you could uh, use to present the outcome of the project, because it is networked. So, so in other words, you cannot, see to the, uh, you cannot go to the gallery and see the network, uh, sorry, and see the artwork. It is not a two-dimensional, it is not actually three-dimensional, it is a uh, uh, it is uh, dispersed. So um, in the case of uh, Tari Rueb, it would be important to be able to walk in this very place and also to experience it, right? This is as important as actually uh, reading about the project. And especially, uh, it is especially um, uh, uh, meaning, um, uh, especially significant if you, uh, Take the example of Jeremy Hyde, uh, Naomi Spellman, and, and uh, Jeff Knowlton project, this uh, 34 West, 118 uh, North, or otherwise. I never remember the, the exact uh, title. So there is no documentation of, the pr of this project available anymore. What you can confront as a media arts scholar actually are um, the written... Uh, reports made after the actual artwork has been carried out on the spot. So in my book I uh, 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 draw uh, upon the concept coined by Richard Kluszczyński of this networked uh, media artwork, uh, but I also uh, uh, look for some historical um, genealogies, and to me, especially land art is a very important uh, field because those artists designed their artwork, artworks in a very similar way, where there's uh, at least a few elements that, uh, uh, taken as a whole, give the full uh, image of the artwork itself. For example, the most uh, well-known um, spiral jetty by Robert Smithson. I don't know if you no, it's a huge structure built uh, on the lake in, in, in Utah, in the United States. But uh, actually not many people is aware of, of the fact that apart from this huge structure and the building, there is also a photo essay published in Art Forum back in 
1967, I guess. There's also a movie that Smithson made himself, um, and there are also uh, the stills from this movie that very often serve as the representation. And the artwork as such, um, actually is located in between all those elements. So that's why this concept of uh, uh, networked media artwork uh, is uh, that importance to me. Thank you. And uh, as far as the locative media uh, art uh, is con uh, concerned, <coughs> there are not many projects of this kind in Poland. It, it was qu quite fresh. And the reasons are many. Uh, in Poland, there actually was not real net art as well. Just a few examples. Yes, uh, Wrocław Biennale is important, but, but uh, especially um, the artworks by Paweł Janicki. This is one of the young uh, media artists. You probably have, should have known him. Uh, so Paweł Janicki, I would uh, mention uh, the project that it's really impo important uh, to me because it, it, it is one of the first feminist uh, web games uh, called Contraceptive Game by Grzenda.pl, uh, <laughs> where the plot was shooting the sperms uh, with the guns so that was a very entertaining <laughs> but apart from from those a few examples we don't have um, anything like a movement I guess uh, not in terms compared to 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 other countries Aleka Polis too, yeah, but still, there are a few names, right? There are a few artists. I know also uh, um, about Aleksander Janicki, not related to Pavel, just the same name, the coincidence. And uh, he also uh, designs some interesting uh, interactive installations. There is another project uh, that might be interested to you, Natalia, called Electrobook, inspired by... Uh, inspired by Lisicki's graphic, uh, designed in uh, uh, Academy of Art in Katowice, uh, which is experimental in many meanings of the word. So we could find, uh, definitely we could find in some interesting projects, but there is nothing like the movement, I think. The, nothing that would be really visible uh, in the field of, uh, uh, of uh, contemporary art. Um, uh, you know, of course, uh, maybe because in Poland video art was this big thing, right? So for a long time artists were concerned mostly with video and my guess is that it sort of uh, caused um, uh, that they didn't pay enough attention to uh, uh, digital technologies uh, and another exception would be probably demo scene uh, strong in Poland, uh, the most seen around computer games, but this is Piotr Marecki's uh, subject of uh, yes. uh, interest. And so, he <laughs> yes, he talked about it here yeah. probably. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have um, a futurological question, unless, if you have any questions, you have any questions. So, the futurological question is completely speculative. So. When you talk about ambient findability and you say that this this uh, ability of space and uh, and human movement in space being rendered and that it's going to change cultural memory radically, so what what ways of changing it radically do you see? Like maybe one or three. So how in the future we will be seeing mm -hmm. this cultural memories that are mediated? So. What, what changes radically and uh, what's in the future? I ha um, we, we, with much hesitation, I always answer the question about the future. That sort of question. <laughs> yes, I, I know, but, but we, we still um, sort of like to have the visions of the future. That's what DGI, uh, digital media scholars do for the most yeah. of the time. Um, well, I just, I just realized that actually it is not so much a radical change uh, in... Uh, um, concept of memory as such as it is a kind of a paradigm shift because actually when you look into media studies so um, and when you of course are, are aware of the fact that um, that um, uh, written texts and printing technology is media too and very often uh, those objects trigger a lot of memories 
And if we uh, also take into consideration the well-known concept of Bernard Stiegler and Jacques Derrida of uh, originary technicity, and I want don't want to bore you with details about 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 the concept itself but in a very simplistic manner i would say that this concept says that there is a kind of this double bind between us and the technical objects like it is also incorporated with the way we evolved as humans that's the, the basic meaning of this originary technicity. Uh, it is not translatable in Polish, by the way. I'm not sure if it's translatable in, in Russian. So we, we don't have a way in Polish to say originary technicity because it uh, addresses the questions about what was first, the humans or technology, right? This is one of the questions we usually <laughs> ask. And this concept, uh, I mean, Bernard Stiegler and, uh, uh, and Jacques Derrida uh, uh, later on, they say they, their answer is that actually it is not a good question to pose because as humans, we always co-evolved with technical objects, with our tools. So I would say our memory is also uh, our cultural memory. Uh, the way we discuss it, the way we uh, uh, inquire it, should also probably uh, incorporate this kind of philosophy. Um, uh, so it is not just tools we use, right? Whenever we want to write something. It is uh, part of our shared uh, her heritage. Uh, so probably uh, uh, if we... Uh, draw upon this concept, upon the concept of originary technicity, uh, we come to the conclusion that, uh, uh, that actually the cultural memory has always been distributed agencies, about, about distributed agencies. Like, um, I think it is not a coincidence that uh, things like photographs, uh, I mean paper photographs, because the digital photographs are a different story. But the paper photographs, the, the real objects, the, the, the hard stuff, it always serves as a, a memory vehicle. And what's in the future? That's an interesting story. I think that, mm, well, to me, um, uh, I don't want to really uh, support uh, the idea that ambient findability means that we're, you know, uh, that we're investigated every time and everywhere we move around the city is not that simple as that. I mean, uh, panopticon didn't actually happen in everyday reality. It didn't actually happen. Like when it's all tracked, uh, then there is this problem of who's going to be tracking what is tracked. Yes. Because there is so much tracked that th there, is, there needs to be another, you know, another technology to be tracking what is tracked. Exactly. And another important issue is big data and the way of processing those big data and the way of inquiring it. It's probably a technical issue, but uh, you probably know that we discuss about the big data thing uh, these days almost all the time. Uh, because our behavior, which is uh, represented as digital data, uh, actually produces such amount of it that we don't have the uh, practical ways to uh, uh, to uh, reasonably process it. I mean, there are certain techniques, and of course the producers of uh, software uh, will be promising you that our software uh, gives you the possibility to see what's in those behaviors, but it's just an illusion. On the same time, there are still questions about small data, about, da about the um, behavior that it's not really... Um, possible to be predicted. Uh, in other words, people are not totally, um, humans are not totally rational beings, and especially uh, human and non-human agents uh, treated together are even more mess. <laughs> that would be my answer to, to the question. Right. So I expect more mess, <laughs> in short. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Большое спасибо. Uh, и, собственно... Спасибо большое.